Well, hello, friends. Russ Barkley here, fresh from the golf course. Wanted to update you with this week's research findings for the week of January the 27th. Even though I'm posting this now on February the 2nd, it's going to be about research that occurred before January the 27th, because I'll be posting another research update this weekend to bring us back up to date. Boy, has there been an awful lot of research since I took the last few weeks off, and uh, it's hard to choose what to cover. But I've picked four that I thought were very interesting uh, for this week, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, as always, right, I begin with a dad joke. Uh, here's your dad joke for today, right? I've been reading a book about anti-gravity, and I just can't put it down. <laughs> hey, do you like the bench in the background? Probably sparkling a little bit on camera because of the busyness of the print. Uh, as you know, I'm in my temporary studio. I'll be uh, creating a new studio here within the next week or so. I'll hopefully change the background a little bit. In the meantime, let's have a look at what's been going on in research. We're going to start with this paper out of Japan, published in Frontiers in Psychiatry, and it's about the prevalence of physical, what are called somatic, complaints and diseases in adults with ADHD in Japan. Uh, and they concentrated, of course, on comparing younger versus middle-aged versus older adults, both those with ADHD and control groups. Uh, and as you can see from the headline here, they found the highest rates in people over age 40. Now, that's not going to be too surprising. I have a comment on that in just a moment. But we have known for over 30 years that as kids with ADHD grow up and get into adulthood, they report an increased number of bodily complaints from headaches to stomach aches to arthritis to joint pain to back pain. We also know they have an increased risk for type 2 diabetes, uh, an increased risk for seizure disorders, and a variety of other difficulties, including migraine headache. Uh, and so uh, this is not going to be too surprising when we find that in Japan, using a very large population of individuals with ADHD, 15,000 adults with ADHD were in this study, compared to a control group of nearly 75,000. And this study was looking at a variety of physical complaints. The, the ones I've mentioned, diabetes, diabetes complication, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, and so on. And in essence, what they found replicates what we've seen in other smaller studies, particularly with clinical populations here in the US, and that is that people with ADHD by adulthood have a significantly higher rate of all kinds of medical difficulties and somatic diseases and complaints. But the only one that doesn't seem to increase with age is atopic dermatitis. And that makes sense because we tend to see that earlier. Kids with ADHD do have more atopic dermatitis, but it's not increasing with age. So, of course, the increase of somatic complaints with age would be expected. We're all getting older, look at me, I'm falling apart, and we would expect to start to see a variety of medical problems with aging. The only difference is we're seeing a lot more of that in adults with ADHD than we see in control populations. And when we compare, compare younger to older groups, the groups that have the most complaints of bodily diseases are older adults with ADHD. But even control adults who are older complain a little more about these various problems. So overall, yet more evidence of a link between ADHD and a variety of medical uh, complaints, somatic disorders and diseases, and this time replicated in a Japanese population. So thought you might be interested in knowing that. Next up is a study, one among many. This happens to be a meta-analysis. Oh boy, love those meta-analyses on the association between prenatal cannabis use by women and the risk of ADHD and autism spectrum disorder in their offspring. Uh, this study, published over the Journal of Psychiatric Research, was able to identify 14 primary studies, 10 focusing on ADHD, four on ASD, autism spectrum, and using over 200 thousand participants. And what they found when they analyzed all the data together is that 
there was an increased risk of ADHD symptoms and the disorder of ADHD in the offspring of women who had used cannabis during the prenatal period, during their pregnancy. Uh, there also was a increase in the risk for autism spectrum disorder, but it looks like to me the risk for ADHD was even higher than for the spectrum. So the authors go on to talk about that prenatal use by women of cannabis is linked to a risk of later ADHD in offspring. Now, I know if I were a journalist writing for the sensational trade media, I'd be harping on, oh my God, here's evidence that marijuana causes ADHD in offspring of women who smoke marijuana. That is not what we can say from this study, even though that would be a headline grabber. In this study, all we have is an association, a relationship, it's a correlation. Here we go again, journalists prone to interpreting correlation as cause in the direction of their preferred narrative or bias. How else could we interpret the study? We know that adults with ADHD use more marijuana, both men and women. And therefore, the use of marijuana by these women during pregnancy could simply be a marker for their own ADHD. And that's why their offspring are more likely to have ADHD. It may not be related to the cannabis use at all. We saw this with cigarette smoking. For 20 years or more, studies were trumpeting the link between cigarette use during pregnancy and risk of ADHD in offspring later on, until researchers began to do genetically informed designs, measuring the degree of ADHD in the women, looking for ways to control for that genetic risk to the offspring. And when they did, the link to tobacco smoking went away. It was simply serving as a marker that mom had ADHD. And we know that ADHD women smoke more than typical women do. So that could be the same finding here. So before we rush off and decry cannabis as yet another cause of ADHD in offspring, it's a correlation. Let's keep that in mind. Interesting finding. It is a meta-analysis, but it is just an association, not a causal demonstration. Okay, let's move on to number four. This is a meta-analysis, surprise, on the benefits of probiotics for treating symptoms of ADHD in children and teens. This particular meta-analysis found seven studies that had compared people with ADHD on and off probiotics and a placebo. Some of the studies also combined the probiotic with methylphenidate and then compared that to probiotic alone or placebo alone. Overall, what did the meta-analysis find? It found that current evidence shows no significant difference in the therapeutic benefits of probiotics compared to placebos for ADHD. It of course found that when people took a probiotic and methylphenidate, they were better than people who took a placebo, but that's the effect of the methylphenidate, not the probiotic. So they do suggest that future research might wanna look at the use of multiple strain probiotics versus single strain probiotics, uh, and that they might wanna look at whether or not the probiotic boosts the use or the effects of medication over just medication alone. That would sort of be interesting, but in no way do probiotics approach or equal the effects of medication. And according to this meta-analysis, the probiotics can't even beat placebos when it comes to treating ADHD symptoms. So thought you might like to know about that one over in the British Journal of Psychiatry. We're gonna wrap it up this week with a study published in Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. This is on problematic media use in children and its relationship to various forms of aggression in kids with ADHD. So it's studying kids with ADHD. There also was a control group here. They did find that kids with ADHD have a higher rate of problematic media use. No surprise, notice they didn't interpret it as the media use causing ADHD. They interpret it, I think, more cautiously, probably more reasonably, 
and that is people with ADHD, kids in particular, gravitate toward greater uses of media and to the extent that it's problematic. What the study did find is that there was a significant correlation within the ADHD group between the extent to which they were using media problematically and their degree of verbal aggression, aggression against objects, aggression against animals, and physical aggression against others, both provoked and unprovoked. Once again, however, a correlation, not causation. Does this mean that problematic internet or media use in kids with ADHD increases their aggression? Maybe. I'm sure journalists would love to report that. But on the other hand, it could also mean that within kids with ADHD, the more aggressive they are, the more likely they are to be engaged in problematic media use. Once more, we see, we can't draw a causal interpretation from a correlational finding because it could go either way. Still a very interesting study on problematic media use. So there you have it for this week. I hope you found this informative. As always, I've cited the links to the articles I discuss in the video in the description that goes with the video. I also list the other articles that were published that week in the description, even if I don't talk about them. You can at least see what came out over there. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me. I'll be back next week with another bad dad joke and a review of our research. Hopefully, I'll have my new studio set up by then. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing, as I always suggest. Please, if you like the content, recommend us to other people who might have an interest in ADHD. And finally, thank you all for joining me for this video. Have a good week. I'll see you next week. Be well.